who is logged on, thank you very much for logging on. Uh, selamat pagi. Uh, if you wish to share this uh, video with your Facebook, uh, please go ahead. You can even carry out a watching party. Uh, then will allow uh, Datuk's uh, message uh, to reach more people. Um, before before I, I start, just a very quick introduction and uh, to set the tone of what we are going to do this morning. It's a, more or less an hour uh, webinar. It's an interview with a very special person, uh, Dato Dr. Ramlan, who, as many of you uh, in the sports industry of Malaysia will know, he was uh, he's one of the rare uh, uh, officer who was uh, the Director General of MSN, uh, National Sports Council, CEO of ISN, the National uh, Sports Institute, and a Director of Adamas, which is the Anti-Doping Agency of Malaysia. And uh, uh, he's been in uh, sports practice for about 30 years. Dato, am I right to say that? 30 years or so? 30 years. 30 years. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. It's such a long time. So today's interview, we will uh, highlight a, a few issues. Firstly, of course, I think it's good to go back uh, uh, in the past to kind of uh, appreciate and understand apa yang berlaku dengan uh, kerja Dato uh, Dr. Ramlan, uh, apa yang kerjaya beliau, kerja-kerja uh, beliau, apakah yang beliau melakukan masa kat MSN, ISN dan di Adamas. So it'll be interesting to go back in history. Uh, in fact, I can share with you, uh, Dato, that even uh, 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 our former director of uh, Podium, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Tim Newenham, Mr. Tim, Tim Newenham, yeah, he texted me yesterday. He says he's going to be very early in Oman, but he's going to log on to watch you. He's okay. Newenham, so I wouldn't be surprised if he's listening in now. So uh, we that, that's the measure of your experience. Uh, we we'll do that, and then from there we'll talk about his experience. We will also then uh, perhaps have a chat about uh, the current sports issues in Malaysia, sports administration athletes' rights, uh, potential reforms, if any, uh, okay. issues on sports integrity, blah, blah, blah. So that'll be just nice until about uh, 12 o'clock. And to everybody yeah. here, if you have any Q&A, ada apa-apa soalan, ada apa-apa comment yang kamu ingin me me uh, memberi kepada Dato, uh, you can put it at the RWC Facebook page. We'll pick it up here. And uh, if there's time, we'll try to entertain as many questions as possible. Right? Um, so without further ado, uh, I, I'll start the interview. Tato, it's been a, a great <laughs> honor and pleasure. In, we have had interviews with uh, other athletes uh, like Sharon Wee, uh, Charlene Zukifli, and last week we interviewed uh, Dr. Vidati, our sports commissioner. So it's yeah. part of an ongoing series where we interview uh, uh, sports um, uh, in individuals. Uh, other than sports, of course, we have also done uh, talks on employment, SME, startups, in this, uh, tourism, uh, etc. Et so it's uh, uh, my firm. We we try to cover as many areas as possible. The purpose of this talk, Dato, is to give ideas, to share uh, experience, so people who listen in they can learn a thing or two from us, and maybe mm. never know be the next Dato Ramlan. We will never know. Yeah. So uh, Dato, um, just um, um, perhaps you can share with us. Uh, you were saying just now your experience in the the, the stadium, <laughs> staying in Keramat. Uh, flowing from there, uh, perhaps you can share with us in a, maybe in the three minutes. Uh, what, what was your past experience in uh, your working place? Uh, how you got into sports medicine? You were just about to explain how you got into sports and and medicine, and then your career in as a MSN, ISN, Adamas. All yours, Dato. I I I did my housemanship after graduating from University Kebangsaan Malaysia in 1988. That was my housemanship year. I graduated in '87. So I became a houseman in 1988, and uh, uh, that hospital was already familiar to me because we uh, all the UKM uh, students had uh, done their training at uh, Hospital Kuala Lumpur. So um, I decided early on um, uh, yeah. not to, to pursue uh, the usual traditional, um, you know, surgical or medical uh, 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 specialties because I wanted to do something different. And uh, it was a bit of a risk because when, when you have a, you want to do a, a certain specialty which is uh, as yet unrecognized, it would be difficult. Mm. But uh, uh, eventually, I decided on on doing uh, sports medicine after you know considering for a while uh, combining law and, and medicine. You know, I was quite intrigued with medical jurisprudence as well. So at that time, uh, it was an early decision. 
So um, I, it helped me because by uh, the time I was uh, doing my uh, medical officer's post in Kuantan Hospital, in the anesthesiology department, um, uh, I did one year over there, and that was really good because it gives it gave uh, gave me a lot of uh, confidence in dealing with uh, with uh, life and death on a daily basis, uh, being mm. involved with ICU and all that. So uh, I also decided that that to be confronted with with death on a daily basis wasn't good for for my <laughs> personal well being. <laughs> I took it personally, you know, when somebody passed away. And, yeah, and uh, it can be quite tough. Yeah. yeah, it really smashed me. And I thought, uh, uh, if I work in, in sports, I'll be working with the healthy. Yes, essentially, right? Mm. Uh, of course, uh, uh, death follows life all over the place uh, at all times, anytime, anytime anywhere. So uh, uh, the most important thing at that point was I had the uh, early decision. I tried it out. I joined uh, a course in physical conditioning. And that was fascinating. The, the head at the time was Dr. Nordin Darus, now Dato. He was a very kind man. He, um, he guided me. And uh, that was when I joined in 1990, uh, 10th of May. Uh, by, Dece by December 1992, um, Dr. Nordin left and he left me in charge. So I was acting director at, uh, in 1992 at 32 years old, you see. So, wow. yeah. Uh, that was the first time I was doing any admin work. But because I was the only doctor left, because my, my senior uh, who had joined NSC, there was supposed to be three doctors. So Dr. Nodin left. So this, uh, this my senior, Dr. Kamarudin, he also left. So I was alone. So there you go. I was also doing, at the time, uh, I, was doing, I was doing my time as, as the uh, uh, national junior hockey uh, team doctor as well. Ah, so express your, your, your connection ah. with hockey. I see, I see. So, so there, was, there was an early indoctrination, you know, in trying to balance time between uh, your, uh, at the stadium uh, by 7 o'clock, right? And again at mm. uh, 4.30. And in between, I saw patients uh, until lunchtime. Uh, and also a bit after lunchtime, and I ran meetings as well, mm. looked at years and all that. It was a small operation, as a, as a, still as a division of the National Sports Council. Mm. Uh, it was still called the uh, Sports Science Division at that time. So it was it was an early indoctrination, but you know all these all these multidisciplinary situations were were I was I was actually used uh, to it because when I was at school, I was I was the prefect, I was the uh, drum major, I was a musician, I, I played basketball for school, I played rugby for house, um, and I was an English debater as well. So you know how, how it is. When yeah. you are young, you have a lot of time. You know, yeah. you feel a lot of time right. and, right. True. Uh, to take everything on board. So, so that was fine. And mm. uh, when Dr. Nodin left, uh, I, 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 I'm not one to anguish about, uh, you know, what, what is before me. I just basically, you know, the hospital training, you just look at the situation and you just you just follow through. So that's mm -hmm. that's what we did. And uh, there were a lot of supportive people, um, and I must I must always thank them. I can't thank I can name them you know one by one. There were so many, too many. Um, yeah. yeah, who had gone through, uh, met me, and uh, eased my way into the, the situation. Uh, the, the one thing I think they recognized recognized in me is that I I was just dead interested in the thing, you know. Mm. And then I was always asking questions, and uh, and trying to to see how I can do better all the time. Mm. So by 1992, uh, uh, Dr. Nordin had already decided that uh, I should be uh, going for my further studies at the London Hospital Medical College in in in, in the UK, uh, where he had done his own uh, diploma before that. I see, I see. Uh, but I was supposed to go in 1992, but. That year, we won the Thomas Cup, remember? Yes, yes, yes. Last time we won it, yeah? The last time we won it. So what happened was, um, they, they, had, they, they had to spend a lot of money rewarding uh, the badminton players and all that. Suddenly, there was no more money to send me to UK to, to study. <laughs> so there you go. But, uh, just, you know, but there was a silver lining with, to that particular dark cloud. Hmm. What happened was, when I finally went over there in 1993, after uh, doing a job uh, for the National Juniors at the Junior World Cup in Barcelona, hmm. I, was, I was on the plane back from Barcelona, spent two days in KL, and back on the plane westward to, to London. Oh. So I, didn't, I wasn't sure whether I was coming or going. 
All right. Mm, mm. So, oh, so tiring, my, man. She took care of everything. You know, my wife is a real trooper. She took care of everything, mm. and we had four kids at the time. So, <laughs> yeah, she one harassed wife and then four, you know, boisterous children. So, <laughs> and uh, yeah. it was a good time. Uh, it was a good time to reconnect my my young family as well at the time. And that was another feature as well. You know, the, the balance between a work and family is another important matter. Mm. And uh, and uh, by by the time I came back uh, with a Master of Science in Sports Medicine uh, from the London University, because the the London Hospital Medical College uh, was a part of the London is still a part of the London University, but they they, they sort of merged uh, with uh, Bartholomew's uh, Saint Bartholomew's Hospital, so they moved down uh, down the road to Mile End. So mm. there you go. Um, the, I came back in. Um, Oh, after after the mass, uh, the MSc, I did uh, a year of attachment to several places. Number one was the uh, 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 Northwick Park Hospital, which housed the Olympic uh, uh, British Olympic. Uh, I see. Program. So you da- at the time that you were exposed really to sports medicine, that was, oh, clearly that was your path. Yeah, that was your path. The uh... actually, I had an advantage, you know, because mm. before joining that course, I had done three years of solid full time sports medicine. Mm. Whereas my other colleagues, they came from orthopedic backgrounds, general practice backgrounds. So they, 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 they have dabbled in some sports cases, but they never mm. saw patients on a daily basis uh, involved in sport. Mm. So, so I, I was already, you know, well into uh, sports medicine uh, without actually getting anything yet. So, um, so that, was, that, was, that was good. Uh, that yeah. was, so interesting. Uh, yeah, not, not only from, from Malaysia, but also from Thailand from Bangladesh, from Barbados, you know, from Australia. And our examiners were people from, from experienced people. My yeah. supervisor, Dr. Rosling Carbon, uh, was also uh, a doctor in the British Olympic uh, setup. Mm. And uh, Andrew uh, ADJ Webber, we call him Nick Webber, uh, he, he's part of the Paralympic setup, you see. He had, an, uh, he had a mishap in the rugby game and he, he had some, 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 uh, some spinal problems. So Are he went to Paralympics. Roslyn was in Olympic. So between the two of them, I have to thank them a lot because they took me on board and, and we really got on very well. Mm. Uh, later on, years down, I, I invited both of them for seminars and, and conferences and all that. So that was good. Mm. And uh, my colleagues around the world, uh, it was good to see that uh, sports medicine is appreciated. So mm. they gave me grounding in terms of uh, how sports medicine should be uh, you know, approached in Malaysia because at the time, was wasn't still wasn't uh, recognized yet as mm. as Specialty. The, the early days, uh, that's all the time, yeah? Very so, early. Yeah. yeah. So you came back and then uh, I, I suppose uh, you got uh, back into uh, MSN straight away or KBS first? Which one was? Uh, no, why? No, no, because MSN is a badan berkanon, it's a statutory body, just mm. like I then is, you know, down the line. Uh, so I I was very much uh, with the top with, uh, with ISN, with MSN at the point. Yeah, but, MSN, but we sport science below it at the time. Correct. Yes. Um, the thing was, uh, by the time I came back, he had, he had changed his name. He was no longer Bahagian uh, Science Sukan Masjid Sukan Negara. Hmm. Apparently, they renamed it Institute Sukan Negara. Okay. Ah, you at the time. Oh, okay. Yeah. In 1994, they had changed. So by the time I came back in 1995, they had a new director, Dr. Jabba Johari Arwah. He hmm. just passed a few years ago, another good man really understood me and then uh, guided me well. He was mm. a PhD in uh, in uh, you know tests and, and and measurements in physical education, so he really understood the scientific uh, way of thinking. Mm. Uh, where you he really indoctrinated me the, the the need to to test and measure, uh, mm. not to make assumptions. You know, because that's that's the uh, the mother of all. You know what what it is. <laughs> yeah. But, there you go. So, but. Uh, we were still at Stadium Jalan Rajin Muda uh, at the time. Of course, right? yeah, at the time, yeah. Then in um, uh, 1996, April 1st, okay, April Fool's Day, we moved to this new premises in Bukit Jalil, mm. the, you know, National Sports Complex. That time, so, that time was new. Lah. It was very, very exciting because yeah. SDRM was a wonderful place, but it was, you know, it was uh, decaying, yeah. Um, we ha- we spent a lot of uh, a lot of money and time uh, repairing things rather than so it was a new place we, we went there 
We started there on April the 1st. But by June uh, the 1st, 1996, uh, Dr. Jabba, uh, because he was uh, director of uh, ISN, but he was on loan from U UPM where he was a lecturer, you see. I so, see. Yeah. So we had to return to University Putra, Malaysia. Then I, I got a surprise because the director general at the, at the time, uh, Datuk Mazlan, Mazlan Ahmad. Ah, Mazlan Ahmad, uh, yes. Mm. Yes, yes. He's, he's, he's a very experienced, a very capable uh, leader of MSN for many years. Mm. He called mm. me up and he looked at me and said, uh, Doc, you know, uh, you take over. You know, very simple. <laughs> and I said, okay, I had to take a deep breath and say, uh, what, what, uh, what do you expect of me? Yes, along those mm. lines. Mm. Not so many words. So basically, there was another another uh, medical officer who was actually more senior than I. Mm. Uh, but for some reason, Datuk Mazlan saw something in me, you know. So he said, uh, "You take over." So mm. that was that was the time, June the first, nineteen ninety six. The beginning. Yeah, the, the, beginning the, the beginning of the second part. Yeah, the beginning of the second part of your career. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. beginning of this great adventure. Yeah. <laughs> there so you that, go. Um, from ISN, and then of course later on, I I know your uh, you and on went on to become the director general. In fact, you were in KBS first for a while, and then uh, no no sorry, you were in MSN first, then you went to KBS, and yes, then eventually yes. you were appointed. By then, ISN became a statutory body. After twenty eleven, you became the CEO for a while, right? Yeah. So uh, and then of course then when I finally met you face to face, uh, ironically we you and I met in Bangkok at the. Um, we did. Uh, uh, yeah, in the uh, Cirado, Cirado's uh, uh, result management course, where uh, you have kindly invited a few of us Malaysians to go there and to learn how to conduct result management. And that's why I met you. And you actually, you by. We have to thank Michelle for that. You know? Yeah, yeah. Michelle, Michelle was the one who proposed my name. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, Datu, we have this. This, uh, you know, uh, really great lawyer who is really keen on sports law and all that. And uh, he's doing work for us and all that with uh, results management, you know, a bit here, a bit there. Then I said, okay. And then uh, I, I haven't met you at the time, right? Yeah, Blum. I heard of you, but I never met you, yeah. But any recommendation from Nichelle is always good, okay? <laughs> right. Thank you, Nichelle. Thank you, thank you. But thank you, Dato, yeah. But it was good. You know, the result management, Dato, I look forward to serve uh, the country. Uh, it's a good place to help our anti-doping uh, uh, procedure and yeah. uh, I think many people don't understand result management. They, uh, yeah. And for those who are listening in, don't understand result management is not managing the result. It's actually effectively tribunal. You know, what to do when the, the athlete is tested positive, uh, guilty, not guilty, blah, blah, blah. So hence the word result management. That's why I met you. Yeah. And today I have the honor of interviewing you. <laughs> there you go. There you yeah. Go. So that moving from there, still within your story, such a beautiful story. Because there's so much uh, history there. In fact, that on a serious note, I think you should do an oral history. You know, um, okay. oral history is where uh, there are people conducting oral history now, where they just record what you say and upload on YouTube. You should do that. Uh, okay. You know, that's an alternative to writing a book. Yeah. Uh, and then well, I'm in the midst of writing a book myself. Uh, it was a project started in 2011 on uh, Malaysian Olympians, all right? Mm. And it, it started in 2011, but uh, it got way late after a while because uh, in 2012, I was uh, reassigned to KBS yes. as, a, as an advisor to uh, Datuk Sri Sabri Chik, minister at the time. Yeah, at the time, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I was away for one year. But when, uh, 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 you know, Minister Kairi Jamaluddin uh, came on board in 2013. He decided mm. that I should go back because that's where I belong. <laughs> that. <laughs> and that's where you became the CEO of ISN at the time. I, I already became CEO in 2011. Uh, after mm. that. So there was... There oh was yeah, a, before that, yeah, before that you CEO. Uh, yeah. before. So my time as CEO, uh, per se, because in 2007, what happened was, oh, well, let's go back. Let's go back a bit. Uh, I was, I was uh, by 2005, uh, that to... Uh, Vira Mazlan Ahmad uh, retired, okay? And then the, uh, I had another one of those, um, uh, you know, calls, you know, this time by the minister herself, uh, wow. Azalina. Azalina, and, Dato Azalina, yeah. And, so, uh, you know, the, the Dato Mazlan's retirement was supposed to have been in July or August, but that was in February, you know. 
So she needed to make an early decision. So I think she was more or less uh, casing the joint as far as I'm concerned. And uh, she, we had a chat and everything. Mm. And I think that she, she probably decided that, that you know, uh, I was worth the risk. Uh, then there, <laughs> there was there another no risk. There is no risk, Dato <laughs> Baya. I think, I, think I, I, I sensed very much that she wanted, um, um, for want of a better way of saying, she wanted a different kettle of fish, you know, uh, to be in charge of this big ocean. So um, the most important thing I, I, I got was that uh, we were talking a lot about transformation, you know, uh, uh, reorganizing uh, and getting new approaches in, in how we manage athletes in, and their performance. Mm. And, um, and that, that was my, my abiding uh, impression at the time. But she, she more or less uh, confirmed that. Uh, so by, by July, uh, I already uh, begun acting. Uh, as Director General of the like National... 2005. 2005. Mm. I did nearly two years of that. I must, I must be, be, be frank and say that it was, it was, it was a, quite a baptism of fire because, because <laughs> yeah, in, in a sense, uh, I didn't know what was in store for me. Mm. And in another sense, I, my colleagues uh, and my co-workers in the National Sports Council, apart from the National Sports Institute Division, didn't actually know what to make of me, you know? And uh, um, and uh, I I had to rely on my medical background and uh, my reliance on on making decisions after knowing the facts. So things like uh, if so somebody wants to uh, you know replace three thousand arrows, and uh, they would expect an easy decision and say let's buy new arrows, I would ask what happened to the old arrows. <laughs> then anybody tested that they're in good condition and all that. Where's mm. the report? That sort of thing, you know. So I suppose um, it led to uh, uh, quite a bit of discomfort, uh, and uh, in uh, probably a lot of people decided, "Oh no, you know, what have we got ourselves into with this new <laughs> doctor, mm. troublemaker?" That's why after that, I always doubt myself. I'm the chief troublemaker, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, but but the thing is, uh, I I feel that as much as uh, we always need uh, some some progression, some development. It wasn't a time yet for, for a massive transformation, you know. A trans mm. transformative uh, mindset wasn't there. People are always comfortable doing things the way they had done. And they, they were probably uh, expecting uh, more of the same, perhaps. Mm. 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 Uh, but um, so, so in the end, in the end, Datuk Sri Azalina decided, since, uh, since I, you know, uh, she, she decided to split you know, ISN from, more or less extract M uh, ISN from uh, MSN and form a separate uh, entity. Yeah, and at that time. So, in 2007, uh, she appointed me as uh, the first Director General of the National Sports Institute. Mm -hmm. We were not, uh, you know, Badam Berkanun yet at that point. So, it was an administrative decision. So, uh, it was exciting, but at the same time, you, uh, we were all filled with trepidation because the one thing we lacked was perhaps uh, 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 one of the things that we needed to have was some sort of political awareness, you know, mm. right? We're not talking about mainstream politics. We're talking about work politics, right? Yeah. We were not very savvy, you know. We were sort of, you know, straight ahead, day to head sort of guys, you know, okay, what's this? What's the situation? Where is the solution? That sort of thing. But sometimes uh, you, you really need to, to, to talk to people, all right? And uh, perhaps uh, give a little bit in order to get more. So that, that was the time when I learned a lot as well. So by the mm -hmm. time I became PG of ISN, uh, I, was, I was in better shape. Um, uh, and I didn't feel so, so as isolated as I was when I was DG of uh, MSN. Because mm -hmm. basically, uh, apart from three or four really loyal uh, people who understood me and what I, I wanted to do, uh, everybody basically, uh, they respected me, uh, make no mistake. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, it wasn't their respect that I needed. I needed their compliance. Right? <laughs> get the yeah, job done. Yeah. Get the job done. Right? Get the job done. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm not the sort of uh, commanding general because I'm I'm down there in the in the in the in the trenches with the with the troops as well. So they were always, always like, why is the DG down here with us? You know, instead of. <laughs> so these are the sort of cultural things that you're, they're not used to. Not used to it, like, yeah. Uh, but you but, changed that. You changed that. Yeah. Well, they they needed time. Yes, they needed time. Uh, 
time that that we we didn't have at that point. So by the, by 2007 we were off and running. By mm. 2008, uh, uh, our top leadership, uh, the, the, the prime minister at that time, um, uh, Pak Lah. Pak Lah was Pak Lah, yeah. Pak Lah because uh, we're quite close, you see. So mm. he, he was very kind, um, and uh, the uh, the sports minister at the time. Uh, um he basically agreed and he brought it to the cabinet uh this was after dato uh, ahmad sabichi hmm. the, the current uh, senior minister in, in, in charge of security yes yeah it's sabri it's my sabri yeah. hmm. another guy man another guy man hmm. he only spent 13 months with us but he was key in uh, getting uh, this thing approved by the cabinet before hmm. it could go to 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 parliament later on Yeah, yeah. That was the decision. I I spent one afternoon with him, and he said, uh, "Doc, you know, uh, I'm really, you know, um, I I'd like to 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 help you, but uh, you really need to convince me." So that uh, um, Tuesday afternoon, uh, the day before the cabinet meeting, um, uh, on on the Wednesday morning, mm. I really put my my argument across, basically because the model that we had as um, as sports in managing sports wasn't actually emulated by any successful sports country in the world mm, mm. Okay, re- really we we are quite alone you know uh, as and uh, we were in a position uh, to actually be uh, overachieving because we are a small country in terms mm. of the economic parameters and indices we were not up there in the top 20 or 30 But sports-wise, we have the capacity to be up there mm. with our badminton, hockey, uh, karate, taekwondo, you know, what have you. And then subsequently, we also dabbled and made uh, success uh, in diving, right, in gymnastics, so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So we were in a position to actually uh, 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 achieve pound for pound much more than than uh, uh, stronger and more uh, and stronger more developed and richer countries mm. so i i had a strong belief that uh, the the true value of, of sports is actually well beyond sport mm. if you think that uh, we are doing all of this all of this uh, admin and finance sports management managing programs and also with with isn we are trying to get uh, what we call um, the performance management side Okay, uh, if we do all of this, we spend as much money as we can afford, all right? Because we we don't have tons of money. So what happens is that it cannot be just about the two or three weeks of joy and happiness in winning a gold medal, uh, or you know one one hundred and twenty or whatever gold medals that we get uh, at regional games and a few more uh, at the higher games, Asian Games, Commonwealth Games, and the Olympics, and uh, It has to mean much more. Yes. The, 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 the influence of, of all that victory must cascade down to society at large. Mm. So this is where, this is where um, we needed to get that extra value to make uh, sports more meaningful in society, not just yeah. entertainment. Correct, correct. So, so moving from there, Dato, uh, uh, what a beautiful... Uh, I, I actually wanted to just set it for five minutes, but because your story was so interesting, I just realized it's already 11:35. All right. So, um, yeah, but it set the tone. See, now the, all the next questions I'm going to ask you is going to be very easy and fast. So, yeah. with, with, with that experience, uh, uh, Dato, uh, uh, you know, you were there literally from the very beginning, uh, the to chart the history, explain the growth. Well, how do you uh, feel your current your observation? V- very quick one, because after that we're going to go towards reforms. Yes. What do you think uh, uh, of your observation about the Malaysia's sports administration now? What What are the uh, good points and not so good points that you see at the moment? Maybe a summary, Nato. All yours. Well, in in a, in a, in a somewhat uh, um, not to say defective because it worked some of the time um, with 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 a model that that uh, that has a few disadvantages. Uh, in terms of coordination within and coordination outside with uh, the national sports associations, what happens is that we wasted a lot of time and not a small amount of money uh, trying to get things right. 
if you look at the uh, people always cite Australia as 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 the the best model of how to to uh, to manage sports, and for a comparable nation with uh, more or less the same number of of uh, people or population, and uh, and uh, uh, and all that. It was remarkable if you note that um, the whole of um, the high performance sport machinery, both in terms of the program management and the performance management, uh, is actually done by a single entity, which is the Australian Institute of Sport. Uh, so that, that was something that if you study, became the basis for the later so-called podium program mm, that, mm, that we came up with uh, after that. Uh, you see, uh, this is this divide and rule uh, situation. It is good, but we are missing the point. We are trying to satisfy ourselves as mm. administrators and try to divide everything up in terms of uh, you know satisfying this guy, satisfying that guy. You know, mm. you know, we lose sight of the fact because nobody prioritizes the most important thing, which is the athlete's performance. Athlete's performance, correct? Yeah. Mm. It really doesn't matter what you harbor as your own personal ambition or professional ambition. It really doesn't matter. Because in the end, you demand results from the athletes themselves, but you are in no way actually um, You're not actually making things easier for the athletes and the coaches. Mm, 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 mm. Most of the time, the situations were so confused. Uh, there were times when uh, NSA guys would be asking me, uh, Dato, you know, we want to do it the way you have advised us, but, you know, we don't want to um, annoy or irritate the people, you know, uh, other people, so on and so forth. In not so many words. I understood. So they were serving two masters, you see. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, on that note, Dato, interestingly, uh, our uh, Encik Nick Razin, who, as we know, is the president of our squash uh, Malaysia, he put this question. Yeah. So Nick, uh, Nick put a query for you. Um, in fact, we also got a good query from Rohan, but we'll come back to that later. Nick okay. asked a uh, question. Salam, doctor. I would be grateful if you give your views on the shutting down of the original podium program. What, what is your view that uh, we had the podium program until 2018? Mm. And then it's, it's now uh, under ISN. And of course, okay. now the podium program is under MSN. What, what is your comment about that? Can, can we address that? Yes? No? Yes, go ahead. Mm. Right. You see... The amount of time we did at the outset of the decision, all right? Uh, uh, you see, the one thing was because uh, uh, Minister Kairi Jamaluddin, Yang Bohromat, he basically decided that that uh, we should no longer be mavericks in the world of international sport, trying to uh, do this divide and rule uh, mode of management. No, no disrespect. In 2010, uh, after a lot of uh, confusion and, and uh, distrust and, and uh, a lot of time uh, dealing with personalities, uh, the, the DG of MSN at the time, Datuk Sri Zulkuplay Sembong, okay? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, uh, he's a very strong administrator, very capable. And uh, we initially, of course, we struggled because the people around us were, were you know, were basically requiring us to, to have a sort of an adversarial uh, uh, attitude towards uh, our existence. But in 2009, uh, after my time as the CDM in Laos uh, Sea Games, we basically came to an understanding and we buried the hatchet, uh, so to speak. And he was very kind in saying that, let's work together and all that. And, and the result of that is in 2010, uh, at the Commonwealth Games in New Delhi, and also Guangzhou uh, Asian Games, we mm. won a handful of medals, all right? That is the result when we do the work the way it should be done by the people who are good at doing that job, mm. right? Mm. So there's no uh, square pegs in round holes or round holes, round, round pegs in, in square holes, that sort of thing. Mm. And uh, we relied on each other's strengths and minimize, uh, of course, we all have weaknesses. We minimized our weaknesses. So we really became united. There was a time when it gave me a lot of satisfaction that despite all the adversity, uh, we managed to survive and, and flourish, okay? Mm -hmm. But it is still not ideal. Why? Because the situation was that uh, uh, there were so many compromises and uh, later on, 
we had the Miller uh, report. Uh, yes, I, I remember the Miller report. Yes, we were we were assessed and evaluated by uh, Dr. Brian Miller from Australia, who brought in colleagues from all over the world. You know, from the United States, from New Zealand, and also from Australia himself, including uh, Dr. Rick Charlesworth, MP. Mm. Mm, yeah, mm. Uh, he was a, a famous uh, ho a hockey captain from Australia. World yes, Cup yeah, he's Australian, Australian guy. Yes, I remember the name. Yeah, yeah. quite quite frightening to 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 encounter actually because he was really. Oh, really? I've not met him before. Yeah, really blunt and uh, straightforward. There you go. But mm. but the thing was, this was the time when we were really assessed by an external party, mm. right? There, there's no there's no internal uh, interest to to for any of us to protect. I mean, mm. we were all there. We had to bear our soul and let people see what we, we, we truly were, right? Yep. So the upshot of that is they came up with a report. It's called the, the Miller Report, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, Brian, Brian Miller is a sports psychologist, by the way, mm. right? Uh, and there were uh, people in that group who were coaches, who were players, who were sports scientists. So there, mm. it was a whole different... Uh, Nice mixture and nice combination of, of uh, administrative and scientific uh, personalities. Mm. So very experienced. And between all of them, they had been to probably you know uh, more uh, Olympics than than we can count on the fingers of our hand. Yeah. So that's that's the the issue we really and needed. It was from there that to, sorry it was that led yes. towards the podium program, isn't it? Eventually, yes. uh, I remember Kyrie brought in YB Kyrie brought in Price Waterhouse yeah. Coopers to advise. He said, "Doc, you know, look at this. Let's do this." Yeah. No, the, the thing was this. Uh, mm. we, we, there was what we call there was uh, this this thing called um, um, very small losses, you know, mm. that led to uh, ostensibly and and in principle really good things. Yeah. Uh, they did not necessarily fail. But they fail to get the optimum results. Yeah, but can, I, can we zoom to Nick's uh, specific point? I love sure. the history. Yeah, history okay. is superb. You know, we, in fact, now that you tell me, I remember the Miller report, and we understand yes. the foundation and principles of podium. But now there is change. Um, do you think, uh, in the words, uh, it was? Uh, do you think is good enough to the, the uh, original program? Look. The way we, we, we the, the, the way and the time that we spent, the amount of time, the duration that we spent in coming up with the program based on the, those principles and, and the revelations from that report, you know, how much time did we do? We took, uh, they were on board in 2000 and the end of 2014 to early 2015, okay? Mm -hmm. Spent the whole of 2015 talking. And how long did it take for people to uh, dismantle this? Yeah, I think it was less than a month. <laughs> Isn't that the uh, the the, the, the surgery? Irony. Yeah. yeah. It took what uh, 10, 11 months to come up with a program. We looked everything in detail with with uh, all this guidance from that report, all right? And also with with uh, with uh, um, uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers consultants looking at the figures and all that, guiding us. Uh, and I was I was. Uh, fully immersed in this, and also we had consultants from Australia, from Canada, from the United States uh, with us, working with ISN at the point, uh, contributing their views as well. So suddenly it took what the whole of what two weeks for people to decide to dismantle it, mm. right? So that question mm. is the answer because basically, <laughs> yeah, it's the answer. I what? knew your punchline was something like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, that means. Uh, the thinking was two weeks, but the, the feeling that they wanted that they did not like this because it represent, represented a shift in, 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 in power. Yes? Mm. Now, I'm not a political person. I'm not a person to, to deal with in shifts of power, right? That is, that is for, for main, mainstream politicians to, to do because that's mm. where they specialize. Mm. I'm a doctor, I'm a scientist, okay? And I'm trying to lead uh, a group of uh, doctors and scientists to serve Malaysian athletes. Mm. All right? So we needed that political protection. Okay? And uh, to get the political protection, right now, if you ask me with all of this, I, I don't think sometimes uh, um, any single uh, person uh, 
you know even even if it is a minister uh that you know whether he can actually protect all of this because we are still subject to external pressures mm, right? right which perhaps uh, uh puts them in in a political uh quandary in terms of of actually trying to to have the sort of resolve and determination to see this through yeah yeah yes because because on, on what basis was a program that had been conceived uh thrashed out debated and and uh really actually fought over between ourselves as well because we really yeah. to argue we took those 10 months and suddenly if if you say that uh, he needed to be tried and how long did he survive yeah yeah so, it was not january it was a, it was a good program i i i i of course speak from a personal experience look anything which we say is good can always um be subject to refinements okay some modification later on the line but the thing that is absolutely true and gold about that that uh, that program was because it prioritized the athlete not only in sport yeah. mm. but also in life so the that, problem, that mm. go on, go on. you know the problem is we think an athlete is only should prioritize sports but yet in in, in trying to uh, assist them and 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 develop them to get that ultimate prize in sport at world and olympic level we actually put them in a situation where they are always in a dilemma whether whether they have a career or their life is going well yeah i have been in instances where for example in the athens olympics 2004 mm. right this athlete fell to pieces because his girlfriend left him <laughs> okay. all right a few days before he was supposed to compete so of course he he fell on the in the first hurdle now you you can't say an athlete is above all of this mm. they fought in that athlete's life to the extent that he has sacrificed a lot of his youth you know years of of youth and carefree existence to to knuckle down and be so disciplined in order to get that uh, that medal whatever that he or she may may want but yet we we feel that they they are they 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 are you know they almost cannot be human cannot mm. have feel cannot have uh, aspirations and 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 ambitions and all that so for you to to demand success you need to invest and believe in them in terms of how you want to help them not only with the sports but also with their lives okay so that their lives are stable their aspirations and career uh, uh, situations are stable so that there's no anguish or any um, distractions on 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 the actual sports training and sports performance this mm. is a very simple concept if you look at the australian institute of sport they took care of everything yeah and let's not kid ourselves and say that at olympic level 3000 ringgit a month is such a big amount all right <laughs> okay. can actually get sponsorships uh and get 3000 ringgit in a day okay and and become really set for life we do not wish to see our athletes prioritize money above national interest that's for sure but at the same time on the other hand we we get on that on that bandwagon of sympathy and say that oh poor athlete uh, has given so many years of his life uh, has uh, retired and all that and what does he or she have at the end of it all oh okay a good university education given a scholarship to attend this course and that, and that course at that university so on and so forth but yet we have not really prepared them for life you know mm. and for life mm. after sport we expect that this transition should be automatic when we we took them as a young 12 year old 13 year old in the sports school all right and that's the time even before uh, they become a senior they need to get used to how to live life while they are having this this sports in their lives so that program this podio program is not just about money because money is about what you need okay to get success mm it's mm. a line in a pink floyd song you know it's called <laughs> uh, yeah yeah no 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 it was was it time or us and them anyway what one nice song i i uh, it goes like this for want of the price of tea and a slice the old man died so <laughs> sounds yeah. like pink floyd <laughs> yeah. so you do not want to spend that little bit extra 
okay, to ensure that uh, all the money that you spent before has not gone to waste. Yeah, penny wise, so pound foolish. Yeah, yeah, you cannot achieve success on the cheap. Yeah, you you cannot. But don't you think, uh, Dato, that uh, uh, over the years, the last uh, five to ten years, um, all the sports agency does take into account athletes' rights and. Uh, for now, do, do, do you think it has a situation? Yeah. Uh, or do you think more can be done for athletes' rights? Look, in, in the first instance, I, I, I recall many years ago while I was still the NSC uh, DG, okay? And uh, there was actually uh, an offer table uh, for one of our top athletes. And the offer was like this. It was about, uh, you know, uh, using the, the athlete's image uh, on all their products at all points of sales until stocks last, okay? Mm. And they offered what, uh, the princely sum of what, 50,000 ringgit for this? Mm. I looked at that and I said, uh, I asked questions because basically I needed to understand uh, value for money, okay? So I needed to prioritize the athlete's interest, best interest, all right? So I asked them, uh, how much stocks do you have? How long will it last? And how many points of sales do you have, all right? The answer was really baffling because I thought fifty thousand dollars or fifty thousand ringgit was was uh, was actually peanuts for that particular athlete. All right, and and we disrespect the athlete uh, and and the, the sacrifices that he or she had uh, undergone and the, the sacrifices of the family by assuming that they are fodder for for exploitation. All right, for 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 financial gain. And we, but yet we are unable to 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 give them the best situation, um, you know, effectively. It should always be an exploration. People should always be exploring. And of course, when you talk about money, you need lawyers, yeah, people in the legal profession, such as you, to yeah. ensure that uh, everything is done legally, yeah, legal yeah. and proper. Mm. Because in the end, where there's money, there's always dispute. Okay. And uh, people's expectations have to be met. Uh, we do not wish for people to cultivate a, a culture of greed. But at the same time, people need to be given what they, they deserve in terms of, of the years they put in, in terms of their celebrity, in terms of the stature that they have. So mm -hmm. I feel that, that we are just beginning. As much as we have recognized this, okay, because suddenly we're talking about sponsorship, so on and so forth. But let's not let's not hide behind uh, uh, jargon and 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 labels, okay? And look at the true essence of what it is. It is always about the best interest of the athlete. Athletes, because, yeah. Yes, because the athlete, without the athlete, what game is there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in fact, uh, Dato, I, I can even add on to what you say that uh, uh, you may have heard that there is a universal declaration of athletes' rights. Uh, there are some. Uh, movement of uh, among athletes around the world yeah. demanding for their uh, universal rights. Uh, inter earlier, one of the issues is, of course, to be uh, uh -huh. uh, fairly compensated. I understand. I yeah. understand. You so what, 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 you're, what you're saying is very consistent with the universal approach exactly. for athletes' rights. Yeah. You know, even without without any any declaration from anyone, yeah. any constitution, any declaration, bills of rights, or anything like that, just plain simple human decency. Yes, and consideration. And you must realize, as, as for me, I will not speak for other people, but if I speak for myself, my driving uh, motivation is always to serve other people. Yes, because their success is my success. All right? So why should I prioritize my own situation, okay, my own prominence, so on and so forth, without, without having this, this great principle of serving the athlete's performance. Even the athlete himself or herself must serve his or her own performance. That's why they need discipline, all right, and all that. So the most important thing for us to realize is that we, uh, we have challenges in our sports model already, okay? But we're making, we making light of it because we are, only, we are people who are kind to each other, we get along with each other. But at the same time, we can so... Uh, you know, minimize these performance losses and, and losses in terms of managing and, and getting the best situation for the athletes so that they are always at peace and feel fully appreciated for their efforts and the sacrifice, uh, you know, of, of the young years. And uh, later on, 
we will not only get uh, successful athletes, but we'll get sports leaders for the future. Mm, because, mm, mm. because this one engenders the proper uh, uh, culture, not a culture of uh, exploitation, both financially and politically. Mm. Because, because we, we had this, you know, sports associations at the risk of sounding uh, somebody on a, on a soapbox, okay? Uh, when I was <laughs> NSC Director General, you know, I decided that I cannot deal with these people the way they have been dealt with. Because it was always smoke and mirrors, you know. It was mm. always about uh, who speaks the loudest, who speaks, you know, the most eloquently. But, at, at, but in the end, you ask just one or two simple questions, then everything will be laid bare. That is all about their own self-interest and perpetuation of whatever power they, 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 they you know, they, they held yeah. over proceedings, which is, which is very disturbing. Yeah. So at that point, we had already talked about KPIs and all that in 2005. Mm. You know, I, I actually asked the officers to give them a set of KPIs, which, are, of course, the other DGs did the same. But you see, KPIs are KPIs. How you manage the KPIs are a different matter altogether. Now, yeah. the KPIs you come up with have to really be tethered around the greatest principle of all, which is how to get the athletes to perform at the best, how you know, to train them and all that. It's not about uh, your own survival in, in, in your job, you see. This is, this is something which I feel... Even though we feel that uh, we are always on the back foot in terms of our own uh, career uh, progression, so on and so forth, I know it is it is a normal uh, need for all human beings to feel that they are properly compensated and all that. But you know, at the end of the day, if we help people to succeed and their success, you know, we we shouldn't be existing, uh, you know, purely by basking in reflected glory, you know, right? The athletes uh, become uh, successful, and suddenly you feel that you you have all of this as your own success. You, you cannot, and and the problem is people think uh, vertically. You know, it's always about Sea Games, Asian Games, Commonwealth. <laughs> Nobody yeah. thinks uh, on a longitudinal basis. Yeah. Okay. Because if somebody fails at a certain games, let's say the Sea Games or Commonwealth Games. You, you mustn't make them feel worthless and, and mustn't make them feel like they are abject failures, you know. You mm. really need to look, study. Because when somebody fails, there will be no shortage of people studying things with a fine-tooth comb. Mm. Yes? You're looking at everything in fine detail. Because there's always this need about, it's not my fault, it's the other guy's fault, yes? Okay? <laughs> but, but you must know when athletes get something, they succeed, then everybody will forget to analyze why they succeeded. Did they, did they succeed because of good programs or in spite of inherent weaknesses in the program? So this is something that, that we need to, to cultivate in terms of, of uh, bridging the gap between administrative uh, efficiency and justifying uh, the program, uh, the expenditure spent, and also protecting the athletes' rights. These three things must come on board like a set, they do not, they are not mutually exclusive. They affect each other in a way that I feel that sometimes people forget to appreciate this properly. Okay, so there you go. Uh, Rick, sorry for the long sentences. <laughs> no, it's okay. In fact, I, I think uh, people need to hear this, you know, um, especially someone like you. I mean, if you are right at the top and you can't share your experience, that's then the world is very funny. Like, imagine, uh, uh, yeah. Pres President Obama or uh, our former Prime Minister uh, uh, Pa'ala, you know, not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> so, yeah, um, but, but it's interesting to hear uh, such a deep insight of um, the intricacies of uh, sports. And unfortunately, whether we like it or not, sports have its element of politics. Um, and I'm not talking about the uh, party politics of either Pakatan, Perikatan, you know, yeah. No, mainstream politics, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, didn't, we didn't, not the mainstream politics. So, um, but moving from there, uh, Dato, uh, I, I, I love how you are passionate about the rights of the athletes. And also, I, I think at, at the end of the day, while you, you sound um, uh, occasionally uh, uh, critical of the NSA, but actually <laughs> you really want the NSA to do well. Uh, actually, the underlying what you, you I, I've been hearing you all the time is that you just want them to do well and don't put their personal interests ahead, right? You know, as much as we want the NSAs to do well, we cannot want this more than they themselves. 
Yeah, yeah. Right? So they must do it. They must want it, yeah. As yes, government uh, agencies, National Sports Council, National Sports Institute, even Adamas, if we want uh, doping-free sport, yes, uh, efficient, uh, you know, uh, administration and management of, of, of uh, national sports, so on and so forth. If we want this more than they themselves, we are in trouble, you know. And that's why we, we are seeing what the things that we, we've been seeing so many years. Because, because number one, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, trying to say anything or reflecting on anything about the process of choosing people, all right? But, but the, the fact of the matter is that uh, the, the processes, the systems and processes must always be strong in order to attract the right uh, sort of people coming into sport. Yeah. And when, yes, when you have that structure all well and ready, then you'll be getting the right people in. But the thing is, sometimes uh, there's, there's also the, the risk of equating, uh, 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 you know, getting a good person with, with high salaries and all that. So mm. that, therefore, we must always also give value for money. Mm. In coming out with the podium program, um, you know, just, just to go back on, on, on the matters of integrity and all that. Um, you, you know, the economic planning, planning unit is, is, a, is a terrific uh, governmental organization. They ask really searching questions. So when we were pre making presentation for the podium program, we were basically expecting 45 minutes of presentation and 15 minutes of, of uh, question and answers. We actually ended up being there for three and, and a half hours. <laughs> Free lunch as well because they had to break for lunch. You know. <laughs> they really <laughs> grill you, lah. Really grill. Some, you know, you know. The, the, I, am I have on that thing was not so much whether it was worthwhile giving that much money for the athletes. Mm -hmm. They wanted to see value. They wanted to see value because sometimes you can spend little, and yet you waste everything. All right. You can be given a lot of money, but don't waste it. Make don't it go it, yeah. the extra mm -hmm. mile. So what they wanted to know was that if you win a gold medal, okay, at the Olympic level, for example, what sort of value do you get? What sort of returns do you get? So I argue that basically, if somebody wins a gold medal, beyond the two or three weeks of joy and happiness and celebrations and all that, once you look at it, you have to harness that success and really cascade it down to society at large. Mm, mm. Because the influence of national athletes is immense. It's, yeah. it's huge. So if you can do that, you can affect not only sports development because you can inspire future athletes to take up sport, but you but because people, when they take up sports, right, what you have is that one youngster playing sport is one youngster less on the streets. Okay, that's that's a very simple realization. Yeah, correct, correct. It's very good, simple uh, uh, equation. Exactly. So that youngster is healthy. Well balanced, okay, uh, can can uh, do all sorts of things and and really make use of their time. There's less uh, crime, so crime prevention is helped. Health indices are helped as well, okay, because people are, are healthy and uh, not healthy for just sport, but also their whole lives. So it helps crime indices, uh, crime prevention. Uh, he helps mm -hmm. uh, social indices as well because when you nurture young people, you help in social and youth development as well. Yeah, so I agree. You get all of this out of that ringgit that you spend on sport, you're getting 10 ringgit on other sectors of society apart right. from sport. Yeah. So that's why they give it to us. <laughs> I love it. I love the way you put it. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah. very well. Real mac yes. macro cannot, view. Yeah. Cannot, Richard. If we're just sitting there and we say, oh, we're so great, we want to achieve great things, we are making promises that we might, we might not be able to keep, you know. Mm -hmm. At the very least, if we fail to win that gold medal, we can come up we can, because we can track data, we can track effects because now we are so scientific, we can track mm -hmm. a lot of things. We can show even though we did not win the gold medal, we only won the silver medal, the value to that in society, sports industry and of course industry beyond sport as well. Because yeah. yes, at least icons, they generate a lot of business, they generate a lot of, uh, uh, they inspire a lot of good feelings. People are addicted to good feelings, you know, why? Right? Yeah. Because if we might have all our troubles with each other, right? And yeah. all that. But when somebody wins something, we're all united as Malaysians. Yeah. It's, right? it's, it's a social, social reaction. The best 
integrative force ever. Yeah. We I mean, it, you mentioned yeah. the magic uh, year 1992, Thomas uh, Cup. I remember yeah. when we, I was a, I was a school so I was in my fi final year in school form six years form six. Uh. So when okay. we won the Thomas Cup that year that night, we were very late at night. So we remembered, I think we find uh, Ong Beng Tiong and um, a very young Chia Sung Kit defeated yeah. Uh, yeah. Lim Kyu King uh, and his partner Gunawan at about almost one a.m. in the morning. Yeah, and, and we were all in my friend's house, and when we finished, we came out. I hugged a yeah. chap next to me who was uh, a Malay guy. I don't know who is he. We just, we just came out, we just hugged each other, and then yes. we drove to the petrol station. Uh, and then one Indian guy gave me a high five. So we were <laughs> so then, <laughs> and, uh, then with, with all with all those advantages, right, and national integration to boot, how much money would you spend? Yeah, yeah, correct. One go. One go. Yeah. That's Such why. A, Sometimes we sell ourselves short, you know, in terms mm. of, of getting across the full value of, of high-performance sport. It helps also uh, mass sports as well. Yes. Mm. You see, when we tested uh, 104,000 school kids, standard one school kids in 2015, as part of mm. our TI, uh, sort of a pilot uh, program. Uh, the pilot program, we tested 20% uh, of the whole cohort, 500,000 almost. So we tested uh, one-fifth, 20%. And uh, and out of the twenty percent, uh, we uh, we managed to get people who measured uh, high enough to be in the top ten percent of of the uh, the results in terms of international high performance sport. You know, we got twenty one thousand. So there mm. was there were twenty one thousand potential international athletes from Malaysia. Okay, so. The money wasn't wasn't really much. It was only twenty five million all across. Mm. We invested from Perlis to Sabah, okay, twenty percent uh, of 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 uh, of the whole uh, standard one uh, population, and it was just the beginning. So maybe uh, only a few of them would actually become national athletes, successful mm. uh, internationally, but then the remainder will have to be uh, kept enthused and interested in sports for health, fitness, and recreation. Mm. And, and, and then in using sport, it will also help youth development because young people, when they have uh, something to aim for, okay? So it makes their life interesting, you know? Uh, it takes them away from all these other distractions that, that are prevalent on the streets nowadays. You know, there's ah. so many distractions, right? It keeps them focused, it keeps their lives well-ordered, and this is the sort of discipline. You want to impose discipline without really mm. understanding how discipline is absorbed by yes. young people. Okay? You just impose discipline, you expect people to follow. You yourself mm. can follow the, the simple uh, traffic lights, you know. When it's red, you still go on. And you expect <laughs> young people yeah. uh, to, you know, to, to, to follow what you say without any question. I don't think so. So yeah. it, is, it is something that we need to... to to understand the psychology of, of, of society, right? How the young mind works. And you need all that energy to be spent uh, usefully in terms of actually having a, a target that can be reached. This, this is another thing, you know, my, my, my hobby horse about, about targets, mm. all right? Sometimes we, we have targets as if we are doing sales, you know, right? <laughs> That just uh, some uh, declaration of targets would would actually drive the success. When we forget that unrealistic expectations actually is the negative factor, because you you ask a person to all there are times in one's life, okay, maybe a few, maybe more than that, when we actually outdo ourselves. You know, we we achieve things more than what we're capable of actually. You know, uh, with realistic expectations, but. When you are expected to, to, to overdo yourself, to, to go beyond your own capability at all times, they always say, uh, mind over matter, mind over matter. You know, it's simply said because you are the one sitting there uh, at the side, at the, at the river bank, you know, telling people in this poor sampan, uh, in, actually in the water, how to do things. So why don't you get into the sampan once in a while and see mm. how well it floats, okay, before expecting too much of that sampan? Right, <laughs> plugging the, the holes and the gaps in the sampan. Yeah. I like uh, the you, way uh, the analogy is interesting. So <laughs> expectation is always, you know, inward. If mm. we look at, at expectations, it's, it should be outward in terms of 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 how wide uh, uh, you can address the expectation. Yeah. 
Of course, realistic expectations are always uh, 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 by 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 almost by not by definition, but almost by nature are achievable. And sometimes it's good to start with small expectations. Okay, like people say, start uh, small in business, then you become huge. So you take everything uh, uh, in baby steps and in uh, in, in small increments, uh, and not be too ambitious and outdo yourself. Mm. So I feel that, that sometimes uh, in, in sports, we actually defeat ourselves, you know. Not so much that we're defeated by our, our opponents, our adversaries. It's always a matter of, of not realizing what our strengths are and how to minimize our weaknesses, you know. And we always confronted with weaknesses. Oh, you're not mentally strong, okay? Uh, you know, your reaction time is slow. You know, people making such comments and of course, there's no shortage of people who will, of course, criticize referees and umpires and all that. That's another, <laughs> another thing as well. Everybody yeah. is an expert. But, but well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really superb story. I, I, I'm just sitting here listening and I'm learning, you know, what, what a good experience to... Uh, this is a um, shortcut way of understanding history. You know, just listen to the history itself. You, you are the man. The history, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> You know, you know, Richard, we, we can write about this, yes? We can yeah. present it yeah. in the written page or whatever it is. Uh, but in the end, uh, what was the human spirit mm. that, that, that uh, underpinned all of this, uh, all of this uh, series of events that yeah. unfolded, yeah. right? How did people respond and why did they respond that way? Mm. The thing is, uh, I think for, for uh, you know, speaking philosophically, you know, I, I, I suspect even for myself and uh, even for, for other people that I've met before and I realized that sometimes that we go through things, eh, not realizing why we do things, you know. Uh, what is it that we want to achieve? We just sort of, mm. it's just a piece of, of actions and reactions, okay? Uh, proposals and counter proposals without having the bigger picture in mind. You mm. know, sometimes you have to have the bigger picture in mind. And, and in, in national sports, especially, you know that the bigger picture includes all the things I mentioned before. You know, mass participation sport, health, fitness, and recreation, crime prevention, you know, social indices, health indices. So if we, we put that in mind and apply that in a narrow sense to achieve that gold medal, then we know that all the uh, parameters or whatever support we give to the athlete will be based on that particular objective, you know. So that the athlete is no longer the subject of, of uh, odium and 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 uh, you know anger when they don't actually perform mm. well. Or because ridicule. Sometimes kind of ridicule. Yeah. This is a human endeavor. Okay. Yeah. In my how how long have I been married? Uh, eighty four. Oh, I've been married <laughs> for thirty years. You better remember right. that. <laughs> okay. Right. You know, thirty eight years. My God. Anyway, <laughs> my first child is thirty six years. Anyway, you mm. know. You know, we we before we both grown uh, in years. You know, we've gone on in years and all that. And, and I wish my wife is still able to say, you know, you were still the hunk that you were. You know, thirty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you have you have to have realistic expectations. So yeah. when an athlete, there's another thing, you know, that we really need to to the 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 transition when an, when a senior athlete is about to to retire. Yeah? about to leave uh, active uh, sports participation. That's where that transition cannot be done in a few months, six months even, or even a year. He has to be prepared from the very outset. Mm, mm. You have to prepare that athlete for, with a whole load of skills, knowledge, capability, experiences to actually uh, you know, be, be in a position to be confident, right? Uh, and less unsure of themselves what to do. Preparing for life, lah. That's preparing for life. Mm. It is something that that uh, the Ministry of Youth and Sport uh, must must always have uh, in, in close cooperation with Yayasan Athletic Kebangsaan. Yes, mm. and also mm. also the Malaysian Olympian uh, Association. They they should mm. get together. Ask these people. They are all ex athletes. Okay, let's not condescend uh, on people and say that oh we know better than uh, than you all because we are administrators. No, we are here to listen to your needs. And then we will facilitate the, the, the realization of those needs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You see, uh, after I retired, I got involved in this group. It's called the, uh, the you know, the, uh, it's, it's sort of a loose council of people, mainly retired people, you know, myself, Datuk Sri, uh, Zuko Pesembong, you know, and a few other friends 
of like mind. Sometimes it's not so really like mind. Sometimes you argue more than we agree. <laughs> it is a good way of exploring things without without being tethered to any set of 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 any responsibilities outside. So we all basically mo most of us are either not in government sector or we are in uh, and we explore ideas, you know. And and this in this uh, council of eminent uh, sports people, okay, uh, to to call it loosely that way, yes. Mm. Uh, actually, have a lot of ideas that that uh, should be brought, and uh, and uh, I I told them basically you can all talk, you know, until the the cows come home. Come but if you put it on paper for somebody to read, yeah, we were just chatting away, you know, like smoke yeah. in the wind. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> uh, that's all, on that point because it's only twelve yeah. fifteen, uh, and of course we have uh, uh, Nick Razin put, telling us go on, go on, uh, continue talking, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then uh, we got uh, Frankie de, de Cruz. Thank you very much. He put this about you. He said, hey, Frankie, uh, good friend. Uh, yeah, he's a good friend. Yeah. Hey, so Frankie. Yeah. And then uh, Nick asks us to go on, or you cannot. We do part two, but hold on. We, we hold on to part two first. Yeah. Can we part talk two. about this, uh, Dato? Um, uh, Rohan from ISN, he yeah. asked this question. He said, Dato Ramlan was uh, the first practitioner in sports science and sports medicine to yeah. hold senior management in sports governing agency. Can yeah. you explain how the development of professionals in the area of sports science and sports yeah. medicine does ISN act provide charter for its development, or do we need a new mechanism being introduced? Now, this honestly, that will, will take at least another fifteen minutes to finish to, to chat. I expected yeah. that from word. He's a deep yeah. thinker. <laughs> you want to try this, or or you, do, do you I think can. we should do a? Uh, okay, go ahead. All yours. In a nutshell, you see the, the problem is, uh, you know. Uh, I spent 20 years leading ISN in some capacity, uh, not including at the time I was in my two years with the National Sports Council. And um, um, I've never been one, either whether it's a, it's a character thing or it's a personality uh, situation. I've never been one to, um, to actually ask people to do anything without, being, without feeling that I'm able to do it myself, okay? So if if I'm a sports doctor on the field, uh, if I ask the physiotherapist to to tape that ankle, I needed to tape that ankle at least as good, or as well as as the physiotherapist. Okay. So central to this is the the notion of technical leadership. You know. All right. It is always um, 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 not to say a problem, but a challenge for for people like me. Uh, they will always assume that uh, oh, um, Dr. Ramlan doesn't know any management because he hasn't know he hasn't gone <laughs> gone through any management courses and all that. But you know, um, at the end of the day, uh, I, I've been through situations where sometimes that very education gets in the way. Yeah, and in fact, right? sometimes the work working experience itself will help you. Yeah, because people continually come up with cookbook recipe solutions, okay, of a formulaic approach because they want to have easy solutions, something that they can... But forgetting that every athlete they deal with is a distinct individual, even in the same sport, uh, the style of play, okay, or in a team sport, the positions that they play, the sort of uh, style they bring uh, onto the plate. So you have to really individualize uh, athlete performance and then you can take the whole thing as a whole, as a squad or as a team, whatever it may be. So I feel that, uh, that uh, um, firstly, you must get the right uh, type of leadership because uh, with ISN in particular, uh, I, I, I make no, no criticism of uh, because I'm on good terms with the current leadership. He's doing very well in terms of mm -hmm. trying to uh, bridge the gap uh, and, and uh, the sort of losses we've had over the past three years. And he's doing very well, and I'm very supportive of, of what he's trying to do. Uh, uh, but I think he himself would, would uh, also recognize that within uh, uh, the, uh, the, the you know the, the group of subordinates that he has in sports medicine, sports science, and all that, he needs to see their own their own proper leadership within those those areas. Mm, because mm. it's not just a matter of execution or something based on perception. All right. It has to be execution based on clear, clear ideas and experience in in that particular area. Mm. So that means if he doesn't have that experience, he needs to find people that he can actually trust 
because there will be no shortage of people okay, within any organization who will want to uh, flourish and get ahead without actually trying to be good. You all know? Right, all right. All they need to do is be good with the boss. All right. Uh, oh, yeah. By the way, that's one of my weaknesses. I was ne I never bothered about being good with the boss. Never <laughs> played golf and all that. Maybe I should have taken golf. Maybe I, I would have, uh, you know, uh, survived that, that bit better. But the thing is, uh, uh, I feel that if, if uh, that is a good point, if you just basically put a structure to it or some semblance of order to how you um, actually select uh, candidates, Okay, for a certain uh, position. Uh, you know, sometimes we make the mistake of just thinking that just because a person is in uh, that particular area, sports science or anything like that, that they will automatically have uh, the level of leadership uh, required to, to, you know, to, um, to, to, achieve. to achieve the control mm -hmm. of all these disparities. They're all very clever people in ISN, you know. They've got masters, they've got degrees, all of them. All right? Yeah. They're very, yeah. very people willing to sacrifice be on contract uh, job for 10 years, right? Not expecting anything. I tell you, yeah. it takes a lot, of, a lot of sacrifice, you know, and, and, and resolve and determination because they love the job. And this is one thing I have to take my head off for every, everybody in ISN. Mm -hmm. Now, look, I, let me be clear. My, my most dear, my dearest wish is to always see people who, who follow after me do better than I ever did. All right? You know why I need to see that? You know why? Because then the place is in safe hands, in good hands, and the place has a future. Mm. Okay? But, you know, nobody wants to listen to a 60-year-old man and they expect him to, you know, to go out and uh, ride off into the sunset, that sort of thing. But, you know, at the end of the day, at the very least, if you have time to, to listen to, to experiences, you might learn something, you know. And then mm. it's, it's not just looking forward that... Uh, that uh, that uh, you you feel you are progressing. Sometimes you have to make sure. Sometimes you have to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. And sometimes uh, the the mistakes and uh, and the weaknesses that we had, you know, with people like me and all my predecessors, there are lessons to be learned. You know, in sport, the the the, the saying: you either win or you learn. Mm. Mm. If you learn, you do never you never lose, because when if you lose now, vic if victory is not yours now. Victory will be yours in the future because you've learned uh, about how to improve yourselves. So I feel that uh, the most important thing for all of us is the capacity to continually improve. Uh, and, you know, maybe I, I always run the risk of speaking philosophically. But philosophy is, 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 is of no value if we do not translate it to action and, and how it governs our lives uh, in a proper way. Mm. So... Uh, that's the that's the most important thing. So uh, you must have then uh, a good philosophy, whatever it may be. It cannot be the same, you know. I think um, with uh, with the current leadership uh, with uh, J. Ahmad Faisal, he's he's basically trying to address the the, the financial disparities and all that, trying to make mm -hmm. the organisation more, uh, you know, more financially efficient, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is something which is great. It's not within my uh, experiential or uh, domain of specialty, okay? But at the same time, in, in ISN, what is the selling point anyway? Okay? It's about the the, 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 the the technical expertise that you have to develop. So the most important thing is to make uh, the people in ISN feel secure, feel appreciated, and have a plan for them mm. to increase uh, the, their level of expertise and experience. That takes quite a bit of planning, you know, if yeah. we concentrate on our human resource, you know, the, the medical, the, the sports uh, medical doctors, the sports scientists, the talent identification people, the sports technologies people, you know. Um, I, I remember we can talk about sports technology in a while if we have time, okay? Yeah. Why that? <laughs> Why that? <laughs> like I said, okay. we can do a lot of things because you know so many things. And I'm not surprised we may have to do a part two, lah, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm personally so intrigued. I, I, I want to listen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Look, at the end of the day, let's 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 leave that to 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 the people who are listening to us, basically. Yeah. Then I'm always ready because now with the MCO, you and I are stuck, you know, in our own. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to yeah. go out there. We're not flying off anywhere. I, I'm, right? I'm writing this down. The issue of sports technology, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Then, uh, because because fact, now, if we we talk about sports industry, all right? Okay. 
we're not be we're not going to go anywhere by just selling stuff, huh? isn't yeah. it? Selling stuff and and renting uh, premises out for people to to use, that that is that is too easy, right? right. We need to invest uh, in, in the development of expertise in sports technology, uh, and 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 cultivating a, a creative and innovative mindset amongst our scientists and our administrators, you know, so that they they can work uh, together hand in glove. The way I yeah. work with Professor Zukopless, you know, hand in glove. Uh, we really had to put aside whatever differences that we had and really concentrate on the most important thing, which is uh, all of this is for the nation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then Rohan has already said, do part two. <laughs> do part two, eh? Yeah. yeah. I mean, do part two, it, that's okay. That, <laughs> that's, there's also a question here, which I don't we do, I don't think we have time with this. It's only 12.25. Uh, uh, Amir Imran asked a very interesting question about how do you yeah. see the role of university or hmm. academic institution to be part of Malaysian sports. Definitely something we must discuss in future. Definitely look, something, look, yeah. Right now, in a nutshell, Richard, please. At, at, okay, at the risk of uh, exhausting people's goodwill, no? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. No, the thing is this. You want to have a sports industry, right? Apart from the scientific, medical services and all that, you need to educate the industry, mm. right? It's not just a matter of doing business and keeping finances and all that. It is mm. about generating... Uh, ideas that meet the needs and requirements of the public, right? And every public is different. You may get a set of uh, uh, statistics and indices from other countries, you know, and once you look at the amount of money they they they, they get, then you start to have all these dollar signs, pound signs before your eyes, yeah. and you start to be <laughs> follow them, you can copy them. But you, you we fail to see that we need to address people's needs specifically, you know, okay? And And our specific needs might be different from other countries. Yeah. So, yeah, and I and I feel that sometimes uh, some societies also they do not actually know what they want mm. right, until they see it. So don't be afraid to do the Edisonian ways, okay? Of of getting nine hundred what was it nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine attempts <laughs> failed before he Fear. got the one, one yeah, time, before, yeah, <laughs> one, one single time when he got the uh, the whole thing right with the incandescent uh, uh, light bulb. Mm. So there you go. So well, don't be afraid. don't be afraid to fail, okay? Yeah, as yeah. Long as you always have that drive to succeed. But definitely, we were we can go into more in depth the issue of uh, uh, universities and sports. We've got a very strong university culture for sports. No, even the universities, right? Because I was on the board of studies for sports science, uh, uh, you know, uh, courses with mm. uh, universities actually. Yeah, and I. I was an, an external examiner for the Masters in Sports Medicine in New Steam Layer for, for quite a few years. So the thing I, I realized is that sometimes uh, you, you just put things together because you want to have something. Yes? Yeah. Right? And, and the, 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 the development or the refinement of that situation is not really based on, on a need to continually improve something, but just based on the need to perpetuate something and, and, and think that it will hold for, for many years to come. It, it, yeah. it doesn't, it does not. So the only constant being changed, after all, isn't it? Yeah. The most important thing is, is for us to look at other sectors, all right? Uh, for example, uh, you know I read an old paper that was uh, written in 1985 uh, for the National Sports Council. Mm. The, the first uh, Director General of the National Sports Council, Datuk Noh Abdullah, still living, mm. you know? Still living. I, can, I actually know that name. <laughs> no. Yes, yeah. he's a remarkable mm. man. No, he gave me a document, you know, uh, uh, written by two German experts, uh, Dr. Helmut Diegel and his associate, I forgot his name. They actually wrote on the setting up of the National Sports Institute in 1985. Mm. But because we didn't have the resolve, we felt, oh, we're not ready yet for, 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 for 1985. So we, we put it off until they revived the name in 1994, right? And set it up as a division. And finally, they let it loose in 2007. Now, if mm. we had the resolve, the courage, okay, uh, and, and the wisdom in 1985 to set this up, can you imagine the number of years we would have had making mistakes, refining ourselves, making mistakes, yeah. Better, yeah. doing better, right? Now we, we, we have to look elsewhere and to learn from other people's experiences. Yeah. When actually it's your own experiences and your own failures that will inform you and educate you the yeah. best. So that, 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 that is the, the situation. People yeah. are afraid to fail, but... Failure is good in the context of pursuit of, of, of excellence. All right? If you feel that you are born perfect, okay, 
and you want to cross that 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 river only when the bridge has been completely built then you lose that adventure of crossing the the, the bridge while it is built you know yeah yeah adventure. yeah don't don't wait for the bridge to be built build yeah. and walk on it yeah build and walk on it and you get to yeah. the other side everybody yeah. wants to swim on land you know mm. they need how to swim on land get in the water you know take a risk sometimes so the you see the 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 technical leadership that we have in ISN needs to be not protected but needs to be understood and and somewhat protected you know from from the the vagaries of of uh, work politics and and organizational politics okay by the top leadership because you really need to have the resolve otherwise then you'll be in and out in and out you lose a lot of time you know and momentum mm. so the momentum is where we lost you know uh we already have uh this situation where we are introduced into this this thing seriously only for the past uh in a decades or so but now we run the risk of losing momentum by simply because we we are addressing a need because of 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 interest other than sports itself mm. i think okay yeah uh, interesting i i must say that my underlying feeling listening to you is that there's a lot more from from you so we 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 cannot uh, end uh, the webinar uh, like this there has to be a part 2 uh, and there's a huge uh, cry of, or queue and cry on the group uh, nichelle your your prodigy is asked part 2 please you know uh, rohan part 2 even uh, nick razin said let's let's continue to do a part 2 uh, let, so let's do a second part as you say maybe perhaps yeah. uh, next week before raya or uh, we we can go people are still fresh in their mind over what happened today if in fact your friend frankie frankie I, also asked us to invite the the press you know so uh <laughs> <laughs> yes, he would yeah. he's yeah. he's uh, yeah frankie tony maria does you know yes uh, i know i frankie Tony. because he, he's a prolific writer i i read his uh, sports oh, we, we won a few uh, hockey assignments together ah uh, yeah so Medical. in fact that what i can list down the things right we have not talked about uh, sports integrity yet in detail particularly oh. the issue of money in, in sports which is a, a bit sensitive but it has to be said yeah. and then yeah. um, it's the, a particular the, mind yes yeah correct correct and yeah. and we really haven't gone deep into detail about ISN yet you know and rohan's question uh, is actually a totally rohan's question can can fill up about 15 20 minutes about what can ISN do blah 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 and then yeah. of course the new question today university of sports uh and uh, i like your two words uh, yeah. issue of sports technology there's definitely uh, something we can talk about and uh, technical leadership in sports you know yeah. so maybe uh I'll, i'll contact you we'll okay. plan a second part and then okay. uh, in the meantime what i'll do is that i'll take uh, our current video i'll do a short uh, two three minutes video to compress all the keywords and then okay. we play so that next the next time when they watch the, the second webinar they will be reminded what you said today because yes. we can yeah we can expect someone to watch one and a half hours no no today. yeah to to I mean, to understand. Not something that i would subject myself to anyway <laughs> <laughs> so why should i expect that from others yeah <laughs> so uh, I, i i must first uh, 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 say a few things before we come to a conclusion number one, uh, can i uh, invite everybody uh, there are about 40 over people watching but I can tell dato that this uh, webinar has been shared many 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 times so i think a few hundred people are watching at the moment uh, which is remarkable you know uh, yes, so uh, first i want to get everybody online who's watching to give uh, dato dr ramlan a cyber round of applause you know uh, <laughs> a very but but don't don't applause too hard because we're going to meet him again next week yeah, or two weeks time then uh, number two, i want to thank all the people who was uh, uh, locked in and uh, watch this video uh I, i'm honored to have so many uh, especially sports enthusiasts from the sports committee uh, community logging in to listen um i also want to say that uh, that to, thank you very very much from rwc uh, it was not easy to uh, have you on board uh, but it was uh, worth the effort to uh, to invite you over uh, and i think we all look forward to have you again uh, any last uh, comments uh, dato No, I I um I would like to thank you, okay, um for for kindly inviting me to to this session this morning and uh, you know um, 
getting out, expressing my thoughts and ideas and all that. Um, and it, it has come at a good, uh, good moment when I just retired and things are also fresh in my mind. And uh, not only the, 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 the ideas, but also the feeling of, of the seriousness and, and the necessity that this is, after all, uh, after 30 years, it, is, it was a worthwhile adventure you know, in my life. And then I would like others uh, to, to get this adventure as well, you mm. know, trying to serve the national sports, national athletes. So thank but you for the, for the opportunity. Very important, Dato. Very important. Yeah. It yeah. is not the end. <laughs> it's, the end. it's not the end. This is yeah. the end of... of, of uh, part one was your beginning. Part uh, two was when you, start, you started getting appointed. And uh, then from now is part three. <laughs> part three of your career. <laughs> Is somebody who would send me a fruitcake or something for Raya or something, no? <laughs> <laughs> well, Dato, anyway, uh, uh, I probably we, we may meet up before Raya for the talk, but if we, if we okay. see each other after Raya, I wish you Selamat Hari Raya Dalu. And to yeah. all the Muslim uh, listeners, thank you very much, Selamat Hari Raya. And with that, can I just conclude by saying this, that, you know, uh, the MCO has now become more liberal. Uh, uh, we mm -hmm. have uh, seen uh, a little bit more movement outside. Uh, mm. But it is still very important to maintain an effective hygienic lifestyle. Mm. Wash your hands. Yes. Uh, uh, stay apart. Uh, uh, learn to be disciplined. We just need all we need is one silly case to start all over again this lockdown. Mm. So everybody, mm. let's cooperate. And one yep. thing I know, Dato, together we will prevail, and we will prevail at the end of this. You know. So uh, thank you very much, Dato. Thank you. Yeah. So and I. Yeah, to everybody else, thank you so much for, for logging in. Uh, Dato, hold on first. Don't leave the studio yet. I'm going okay. to end the broadcast. And then uh, thank you, everybody. And then we will announce the part two of this talk. We must have a part two. Thank you, everybody. Terima kasih. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.